I looked up to him as this biggest giant in the land. I, I wanted to be just like my dad. My dad was in my face telling me that I was nothing. I would never be anything. That he regretted the day I had even been born. When my dad had finished with me, he had tied my hands to that stud wall, stripped me of my clothing, and when he had finished raping me, We all want to be able to look in someone's eyes at the end of the day and see in their eyes that we truly matter, that we have great worth, that, that we are a treasure in the kingdom of God. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is Colette Burkue, and I'm your host for today's program. It's a disturbing reality but every third or fourth person in your church or that you see on the street or at work is a victim of childhood sexual abuse. Our guest is Danny Wallace. You may know him as a Christian singer, but as a young boy, Danny was subjected to repeated sexual abuse. He eventually developed homosexual tendencies and contracted the AIDS virus. But then Danny found out about the power of God to heal the sick and to set the captives free. My name is Danny Wallace, and I was born December the 28th, 1954. Actually, many people who know me would tell you that I was born a privileged child to uh, one of the finest men who ever lived in Madison County, Alabama. My dad uh, grew up on a cotton farm, but very early in his life, he became a master carpenter. And when he was... Uh, working building homes and I was four years old, he decided that we would move back to the country where he grew up and he built a little three bedroom frame house right across the gravel road from where his father, my grandfather, still had a 80 acre cotton farm. And I, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven because I loved running in the summertime barefoot with nothing but a little pair of red cut off shorts and no shirt. And uh, I tanned so fast that I would change nationality in about 15 minutes in the sun. And I would, uh, I, I had a penchant from a very early age. I loved Superman. And I would tie a little red cape around my neck, uh, run across the gravel road, go up to my grandfather's barn, jump out of the barn loft with that red cape yelling up, up and away because I just thought that one of these days I'm going to jump out of the loft and I'll be able to fly. And thankfully, my grandfather had discerned my stupidity and he put a thick layer of hay at the bottom of that barn loft so that his grandson would not kill himself when he jumped out. Little did anyone know that the finest man who ever lived in Madison County, uh, this hardworking, humble, shy uh, man, behind closed doors, he was anything but because when I was five years old, I was in his workshop one afternoon uh, out behind that he'd built out behind our home. And I was sitting at the base of the table saw, catching little blocks that would come off of the saw, building castles to the sky and the sawdust, just generally making a nuisance out of myself, I'm sure. And I've often said in sharing my story uh, with people uh, in a live venue that I don't know what I said, I don't know what happened, I, I don't know what I did to provoke it. But on that fateful afternoon, the finest man who'd ever walk the earth in Madison County, Alabama, from out of nowhere, uh, with his fist doubled up, he struck me in the side of the face. And I remember sliding across a sawdust floor and my head struck a cabinet in the corner where my dad had his pornography stored. Now, I was born in 54, so I was five years old. This is in the late 50s when this happened. We didn't have internet then. So the pornography was his magazines, his eight millimeter reel-to-reel -reel films, Polaroid pictures of himself and various people. And yes, at five years old, I had already discovered those and knew far more than any five-year-old child should know. But that wasn't what was on my mind that afternoon. The pain was so excruciating and up until that moment, my life had been seemingly perfect. I adored this man. I, I looked up to him as this biggest giant in the land. I, I wanted to be just like my dad. Every little boy does. 
uh, I, I saw him as strong and I saw him as everything that everyone who admired my dad saw in him, that he was humble and he truly was. He was very shy. He was very hardworking. My dad would give you three times the work for half the price that he had quoted. He would raise huge gardens just to give away the vegetables to the community. I never could quite discern if it was his natural generosity or if it was all part of my dad's deep desire to maintain this reputation that he had in the community and how people saw him. But on that afternoon, as I was struggling to get to my feet through the tears and the sweat and the sawdust, um, I remember a central thought in my mind and I was thinking so fast in my mind, if I can figure out what's wrong with me, if I can figure out what I said or did wrong, and if I can correct that, then maybe my daddy will love me again. And my dad was all over me before I could even get to my feet. He was cursing. He was so down in my face, I could feel the spit hitting my face. And for the first time in my young life, I could smell alcohol on his breath. And I realized at that moment that my dad uh, had a secret alcohol problem. I would learn in years to come that my dad could literally drink a, a whole bottle of whiskey and probably walk a straight line if he had to. But most people who knew him did not know that. All of these thoughts were going through my mind. I was trying to get to my feet. My dad was in my face telling me that I was nothing. I would never be anything. That he regretted the day I had even been born. And on that fateful afternoon, uh, the enemy opened a very horrible door in my life. I know now what I did not know then, that it was his desire that I would never sit here today. The enemy knew that if he did not thwart the destiny that he recognized that my Papa in heaven had for me, that if he did not silence me there, then one day I would just be the kind of guy that would care less what you thought of me, that I would become so transparent and tell you every single step that I've made and everything that has happened in my life. And so what happened next, my dad stripped me of all of my clothes and he had a partition wall down the center of that workshop where he was going to wall the shop off. And, and eventually he was going to build furniture on one side and then spray finish the furniture on the other. But as of yet, it was just studs uh, down the center of the shop. And on that afternoon, when my dad had finished with me, he had tied my hands to that stud wall, stripped me of my clothing. And when he had finished raping me in his garage behind closed doors, I, I realized as I looked down in the sawdust that I stood in a pool of my own blood. Just as surely as you had buried that little boy named Danny Wallace in 1959, just as surely as you had dug a grave behind that workshop and buried me, that child was gone. He, uh, he was gone forever. Immediately, my heart became so dark and so black, and my life uh, became so... Uh, it just focused on staying a couple of steps ahead of a predator whom everyone else deemed to be the greatest man they'd ever known. I was either trying to survive or I would go to bed at night with a couple of prayers on, on my mind, and I'll explain these prayers and why I was even praying in just a second. I, one was, if I can get this right, maybe my dad will love me. But, but closely connected to that, was this prayer that if there is a God, if there truly is a God, then surely you will not let me wake up inside the four walls of the finest man who's ever lived. I want to I wanna stretch out inside jasper walls in a cool meadow, and I want to count angels flying overhead. But every morning, just like clockwork, I would wake up once again, whom everyone thought to be the privileged son, firstborn son of the finest man who'd ever lived in that county. And so my day was consumed again with staying ahead of him because between the ages of five and 10, my father had already sold me to more men than I could count. I remember when I was six years old, my dad sold me uh, one Friday afternoon to a man who offered him a basket of tomatoes and a $5 bill for a little fun with his firstborn son. And my dad said, you keep the $5, that's way too much. 
So for a basket of tomatoes that I saw my dad just carefully place over in the bed of his pickup truck, I realized at six years old what my worth was, that I truly was nothing. If, if I've been reduced in my father's eyes to be worth only a basket of tomatoes for what this man was about to do to me, then surely I am exactly what he has declared over me. I'm worthless. I have no worth. And those were, that was my life between five and 10. If you'd like to read more about Danny Wallace's incredible journey of survival, from horrendous childhood sexual abuse, trafficking, homosexual confusion, and his healing from AIDS, order a copy of his book, Masquerade, a true story of unmasked freedom. It's an amazing story of divine deliverance from the emotional pain of abuse, slavery, and sexual bondage. And while you're at it, pick up a second copy of Masquerade for that friend who needs inspiration and hope. Simply go to dannywallace.org. It was nothing to sit at my father's supper table, and I would say the wrong thing or look in the wrong direction. And my dad would throw my food in the garbage, and he raised pigs down at one end of our house in a muddy hog pen. And my dad would grab me by the collar, drag me to that hog pen. He would throw me in, tie a rope around my ankle, tie it to the hog house, and I had to stay there until I ate what the pigs ate. And I often tell these pastors, if you've ever eaten with pigs. Trust me when I tell you it's all up from there. You could take me down to the local convenience store and buy me a can of Beanie Weenies and I would think I was at the Ritz Carlton. You can't always judge a book by its cover. There are many people walking in our lives every day who appear to have it all together. And those of us who have made the mistake that the Pharisees made, which is to judge the outside of men, we often see people as they're presented. And we never pause to truly look in their eyes, to, to listen to their heart, or to open our life up to give them a safe place to bear theirs. If we did, I think we would most likely discover that in our own families, and our circle of friends, everywhere we go every day, there's someone with a story that's not all that different from mine. Someone who may look a little high maintenance, but guess what? They have been somewhere that your heart and your mind could never dream or imagine. By the time I reached my uh, teens, looking for the love of a father, I, I, I had one foot in a homosexual world, one foot in a heterosexual world. I didn't know how I got there. I had no idea how I was going to get out of it. I had become a master at building emotional mass to protect my heart. Once those that you should be able to trust the most have come inside your heart and have violated you so deeply. You build high walls of Troy around your heart so that no one can come past here. I'll, I'll let you view me from beyond the wall, and only then will you be allowed to see the mask that I have on. Uh, I will portray myself as I believe I need to so that you will deem me to be acceptable in your eyes. And that's who I became. By the time I was six years old, I'd taught myself to play keys. And I don't read any music. I, I, just, would, I just had an, a gift from God to do it. And, and it was a great outlet for me because my dad's only sister was the only Christian that I knew of in our family. And her husband led the youth choir at, at their church. And they recognized the gift in me, and they would take me to church, take me to these old Southern gospel singings back in the day of the Happy Goodman family, the singing Rambos, people like that. And I loved it. I really loved going to those regional singings and maybe walking down the aisle of the church and hearing some of the ladies go, hey, if you heard that kid, that's him. He's really good. And I thought, mm -hmm, you doggone right, I'm good. Because I had my little gospel music mask on for those few moments in that night. I was somebody. I mattered. And let me tell you, uh, I don't know everything about everybody that I meet, but you can stand me on a platform in front of a crowd of 10,000 people, and I can tell you what everyone in the crowd needs and wants the most. We all want to be able to look in someone's eyes at the end of the day and see in their eyes that we truly matter, that we have great worth, that, that we are a treasure 
in the kingdom of God. We just want to see that reflected in their eyes. And so for that moment, it was everything to me. Now, that thing that is a treasure for you to survive, my Superman character had even developed far greater than before. Uh, now, when I would go to the barn loft of my grandfather's barn, I truly needed to fly. Because if I could, little did anyone know that I would fly so far away from the home of the finest man who'd ever lived that I would never come back again. I married very young. I married when I was 17 years old. God sent me an angel. And when I first saw her at 17 years old, I, I thought she was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. She wanted nothing to do with me. I was this skinny little nerd with black glasses on playing a ragtime gospel piano. And she, she came from the right side of the tracks. I came from the wrong side. And uh, for, for that first meeting, she was not very interested. But as God would have it, we married at 17 years old. God called me into ministry at 19 years old, and yet I still had my secret struggle with homosexuality and all the brokenness from the past. How did He call me in ministry? How did that happen? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you this important thing that happened. Uh, when I was 10 years old, my dad came home from work one day and said that he had a load of wood stored in an old barn. If I'd go help him load it, I could make some spending money. Hey, I was, on, I was on that quickly because I would use my spending money to buy new Superman comics when my mother would go to the grocery store once a week. There was a drugstore nearby and they sold Superman comics. I would use my cotton picking money and so this money dad was promising me, I could just envision the new comic books. I'm in the truck, it's dusky dark, we're headed off to that barn, and in the distance I see the barn. Before the truck even comes to a stop, I'm out the door, I run through the door of the barn. And as my eyes adjusted inside the barn, the most horrible feeling hit me. There was no wood in the barn. There was a stained and filthy mattress right on the dirt floor in the center of the barn. And I heard this hissing voice in my ear that was saying, you stupid little fool. You fell for a load of wood in the barn with all you've been through, with all that you've been through over the last five years. You're that stupid. You know what? You're not just everything your father has said that you are. You're not just worthless. On top of that, you're just plain stupid. That's exactly what I felt. And in a panic, I was going to turn and run out of the barn, and I realized I was already encircled by about 15 big, strong, country, hardworking men. Not the guys you would imagine at leading the gay pride parade. These were country boys that uh, were strong, big, hardworking men who had paid my dad for a little fun with the kid. And on that afternoon, when each one of those men had had their own idea and way with the firstborn son of the finest man they believed they had ever met, uh, I looked down on that mattress and I realized that once again that mattress was soaked with my own blood. You can learn to deal with a lot of pain. Uh, those of you listening to me who have experienced a lot of pain, I know that you know what I'm talking about. You can go into your imagination, you can become Superman, you can become a lot of things. I had already learned by that time to just simply comply with the, with the horrible things my dad required of me. But something happened in that circle that changed everything for me. It was the enemy's final attempt to ensure that I'd never make it this far, that I would never sit here. One of the men said to my dad, and my dad was sitting over in a shadowy part of the barn in an old cane bottom chair. And the man said, what are we going to do with him if we kill him? And without missing a beat, my dad said, we're going to get rid of him. I knew right then and there that old man's never going to love me. I'm never going to go to bed again and try to figure out how to get it right. I don't know how. There's no way for me to get it right. I don't know why, but he will never love me. And I resolved right there in the center of that barn. If you want to know what a child who's gone through that kind of abuse thinks, let me say it. And if they'd like to edit this later, they can. In my heart, I was saying to hell with all of you. I don't care if you love me. I don't care if you accept me. I don't care if you even like me. I will not bend, I will not bow, and I will not break. And from my spirit, I was even declaring to my father, 
I will never cry for you again. Yeah, I don't care what you do to me, you can feed me every meal with the pigs. I will not break. If you'd like to read more about Danny Wallace's incredible journey of survival, from horrendous childhood sexual abuse, trafficking, homosexual confusion, and his healing from AIDS, order a copy of his book, Masquerade, a true story of unmasked freedom. It's an amazing story of divine deliverance from the emotional pain of abuse, slavery, and sexual bondage. And while you're at it, pick up a second copy of Masquerade for that friend who needs inspiration and hope. Simply go to dannywallace.org. One Friday afternoon, when I was 11 years old, uh, my uncle, who took me to church, gave me a call and said that there was a little country Baptist church revival that had been going on all week, and the piano player had gotten sick. The pastor had asked him to give me a call because the pastor had heard me play before and said, would you, could Danny come? I thought, would I come? I'd do anything to get out of this house. Little did my uncle know, because he and my dad's sister thought my dad was the finest man who had ever lived. I was waiting on the front porch. I'll never forget that revival. Oh man, I was so ready. I had my gospel music mask on. I walked down the aisle of that church and I could already hear the whispers. That's him. That's that boy. Have you heard him play? Oh, that's Malcolm's son. Everyone thought that I was the privileged firstborn son of a great man in their community. They all knew my dad. And they thought I was so talented that I had everything. Little did they know, if my mask had slipped even an inch, they wouldn't have loved me. If they had saw how broken and so discarded and so worthless and, and how bloody my heart had truly become, they would not embrace me. But I kept that mask in place. I'll never forget that night. When I finished playing, I went and sat down by my aunt and uncle. And the old evangelist who went to the pulpit, I had heard this guy before, and he didn't have but one gear, and that was wide open. And he didn't have but one sermon. I remembered it well. Everybody was going to hell. Everybody but him, I assumed. It was his favorite sermon. I mean, you could go to hell for sneezing. Uh, he would preach hell so hot that you literally would think the soles of your shoes were going to melt while he was preaching. But he often preached so loud and so hard, and he would spit and jump so much that I couldn't understand half of what he said. But on this fateful night, if you don't believe that our God has such a heart of compassion to reach further than any man walking the earth believes his arm will reach, that old man walked to the pulpit, and in the quietest voice I'd ever heard him speak, he began like this, if I had a title for my sermon, it would be, would you like to know a father who loves you? He had me from jump. I was about to tune out and just zone out and wait for the invitation when I could be superstar again. But when he gave his title, he had my heart. He only preached about 15 or 20 minutes. And in that 15 or 20 minutes, he told me about a papa who, when I walked in the room, his heart skips a beat, that he adored me, that when he looked at me, he saw a child that was wondrously made in his own image. And I so needed and wanted to believe it, but yet as I could sense the invitation coming, I was already reaching for my mask to quickly guard my emotions. Can this possibly be real anyway? Surely not. And I'm about to mask myself and he made a motion toward where I was sitting, and he said, stay right there, Danny. I don't want any music tonight. We stood, and I gripped the pew in front of me, and his invitation was simple. No music. He said, if you would like to know a father who loves you, step out. I knocked everybody in the way. I, 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 I didn't just step out. I ran into that dusty, old, simple altar. And the little boy who had held to his promise for a solid year that I will never cry again, a river came out in that altar. And I'm sure everyone in the church thought that the privileged boy of the finest man who'd ever lived had lost his mind. But no, 
I had just finally found it. Because right there in that altar, I will never forget the voice that spoke to my heart. It's the sweetest voice that has carried me across so much brokenness and into such healing in my life. And that voice simply said, Danny, you finally found the Father who will never leave you or forsake you. No matter where you go, highest mountain, lowest valley, I'll be there with you. I was there when your dad raped you in the workshop at five years old. If I had not, you would have been buried behind that shop and they wouldn't have found you for years. I was there with every meal you ate with those pigs and when you took a bite, I took one right along with you. And on that Christmas Eve at 10 years old, when your dad beat you within an inch of your life, stripped you naked, tied your hands and feet together, and locked you in an old chest freezer all night long that had a hole drilled near the bottom where you could breathe through it, the freezer didn't work anymore. Just before the lid was closed, I spent that Christmas Eve night right there with you. I have always been with you. And I will go with you wherever you go. You know, he didn't say this, but he might as well have. They can one day say that you're an author, you're an international speaker, that people are making a movie about your life. Wherever you go, I will be there. Or you can be trampled when you leave this revival and go back into the secret shadows of that home that no one knows anything about. And the abuse can escalate, but I promise you this, I will not leave you. And you know, I left that revival so full of joy and I knew it was going to be worse because my dad was going to hate the decision I had made. And he was really going to hate this fact. There was nothing he could do about it. My dad would have declared that I would never set foot in a church again, but guess what? It was his only sister who took me to church. He could not deny me going without playing his hand to the one that treasured his reputation the most. God truly has a plan in our life.